Competitors, in voluntary order, make your 30-second opening statements. Please stand and direct your opening statements to the audience. The timer will indicate when your 30 seconds have elapsed by holding up a red card. You may begin. Mm -hmm. With close to 47,000 commercial farms across the state of Florida that produce over 300 commodities and supply close to 1.5 million jobs throughout our state, Farm Bureau holds a huge responsibility to not only represent all of these producers and ranchers and farmers across the state of Florida, but also make sure all of their needs are met. I'm very excited for these um, constructive conversations that we will have today to see what role Florida Farm Bureau plays in this situation. <coughs> Uh, the state of Florida boasts a diverse agricultural environment that uh, contains um, crop, dairy, and meat producers. Accordingly, uh, it's my view that Florida Farm Bureau and the Greater uh, National Farm Bureau should, one, leverage existing advisory, uh, advisory committees, and two, pursue cost-saving programs that will both develop leaders in the process and um, promote the consumption of uh, Florida agriculture. Um, Florida is a growing state with a growing population with diverse climates from all the way to the Panhandle down to South Florida and Farm Bureau is an evolving organization as well with the influx of population into the state and I'm excited to have a discussion about this. You have heard the opening statements. The competitors may now proceed with the discussion. Competitors, please direct your discussion to your fellow panel members. So Doug, I know that um, you were the first one to speak about um, advisory committees, and I know um, there are 16 that Florida um, Farm Bureau has across the state. So what role do you think that these advisory committees play in making sure that we're including all producers whenever it comes to conversations about producing, marketing, and the policies that play in the Florida agriculture? So I think the advisory committees um, fulfill uh, two of those roles from the perspective of developing leaders, and uh, making sure that there's cooperation amongst the different uh, producers in the state of Florida. So for example, you have a uh, budget and, econ and uh, economy committee, I believe, and that's pretty comprehensive. Um, if you're any sort of producer in the state of Florida, I can imagine you want to know what uh, you know different outlays are uh, at the state and federal level, whether it be for tax exemptions, uh, crop insurance, things of that nature. Uh, as well as what the economic environment is looking like uh, with respect to you know, the cost of inputs and how that might, may, might affect your operation. Um, another thing to touch on is, you know, there's a citrus and sugar committee, for example. They're distinct committees, but, um, you know, you could have a situation where committees that are typically siloed off because they're, you know, different industries can work together to, um, you know, work towards a common goal. So, uh, I mentioned this at our last discussion. I mean, in the case of citrus and sugar, um, you could talk about different programs like the Sugar Act and how it's uh, protectionist and makes a price floor for sugar and makes sure that uh, American sugar producers can always keep employees and uh, make money. And then in the case of citrus, um, you could have these two committees work together to make sure that one, Congress is passing nationalist uh, policies, and two, Congress is pushing you know, research in the areas like citrus where it's desperately needed with respect to green. Do you like to expand your? I like that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I was also thinking about these advisory committees, specifically with the budget and economy, simply because uh, Florida agriculture, they definitely, it um, heavily contributes to the economy here in Florida. But because, um, as you mentioned, we are a growing state, we are, our population is rapidly increasing um, day by day. So it's interesting to see how these different advisory committees work together um, in the economical challenges that farmer ran farmers um, are facing across uh, the state of Florida. Um, I do think it is um, interesting that we do have an advisory committee where there's um, an individual from each committee on that one to simply uh, bring together some cohesiveness throughout um, the agriculture industry in the state of Florida. So I think that is an important to note. Um, shifting more towards the future of Farm Bureau leaders, I would like to speak on, you know, a personal opinion and also some personal experience. I think that uh, Florida Farm Bureau does an awesome job of reaching out to um, these youth leadership 
um, organizations and really building a relationship with them. Um, for example, Florida FFA, Florida Farm Bureau is um, one of the longest standing and largest supporters of Florida FFA. They have a huge presence here, um, actually here at the Creek Royal um, in June whenever that state convention uh, rolls around. And I had the opportunity to serve as a state officer and see that from behind the scenes. And I really think that um, it really shows the different opportunities that are available in Farm Bureau that are off the farm, and that includes um, your lobbying, your marketing, making sure that all of those different voices are being heard. And I feel like if uh, Farm Bureau, if they really, um, you know, pull the curtains back a little bit and show those those young members, especially those in high school, those kind of looking um, for a career path, they really showed how their involvement plays um, in the future and, you know, creating these dynamic leaders for our agriculture industry. I really feel like that could be a huge push and a huge advantage um, for Florida Farm Bureau. Um, so to expand upon that, another program that's pretty important and is more directly related to Farm Bureau's uh, wife and all, uh, and I think it's uh, integral to developing young leaders who one, are going to succeed the uh, you know, aging good old boys who currently run Florida agriculture as best as they can. And two, are going to eventually find themselves in policy making positions, whether it be in a uh, non-governmental group like Farm Bureau or whether it actually be in you know, uh, state or local, uh, state local federal government. Um, additionally, to touch on the advisory committees, uh, just in terms of um, describing the characteristics and making them a great breeding ground for leadership. Uh, they put you in a position where you're you know, met with a lot of problems and uh, opportunities for decision making and uh, you know, problem solving with respect to um, a given industry, whether it be dairy or beef um, or other uh, forms of livestock. Um, and then on, on top of that, it puts you in a position where um, not only are you just presented with these problems, but you're presented with streams of information that you, would not, that you would otherwise not receive if you were, one, not a part of Farm Bureau, two, not a part of uh, that greater advisory committee, and you know, three, just part of the individual committee for your uh, industry. And so all in all, I think that these are opportunities should you encourage people to join these committees. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for them to come, become more, in, uh, more informed on the state's agriculture as a whole, uh, more informed on what pro uh, problems are facing it, and um, you know, by giving them more opportunities to uh, present solutions to these problems and develop some of the leaders. So, speaking of those um, advisory committees, I think one trend that I um, have seen throughout Florida agriculture in just you know the past ten or ten or so years are um, we are seeing kind of this uh, shift, I guess you could say, where we're having smaller farms, but those smaller farms are finding a specialty market for um, their product. For example, um, milking our dairy down in Okeechobee, Florida, they uh, recently started uh, making their own ice cream. And now they're adapting their entire um, farm farming plan to uh, try to mainly focus on the agritourism and the ice cream and their bottled milk aspect of their business. But then on the other side, you have other um, commercial, all farms are you know commercial, but you have these larger farms that are still a part of a, a cooperative and, and producing uh, a good for um, you know the the public. Uh, an, an example of a farm like that would simply be North Florida Whole Seeds, which is uh, located in, in Trent, Florida, and they are um, you know some of the largest producers of milk in the state of Florida and in the southeast. But they are part of cooperatives, so. Um, they handle all of their processing, bottling, and marketing of their products. So, what I'm, what the question I'm getting at here is, what role do you think Farm Bureau plays in ensuring that both of these, you know, separate types of operations are um, being seen, their voices are being heard, their products are being marketed? Um, so, what role do you believe that Florida Farm Bureau plays whenever it comes to situations like that? Um, so, glad that you brought up this topic because I was uh, dying to talk about marketing. Um, a model program that I think Farm Bureau should uh, commercialize into more industries is the Beef Checkoff Program. And essentially what the Beef Checkoff Program does is that for every uh, head of cattle that is sold, the dollar is taken off and is put towards this, uh, essentially uh, an endowment for marketing, for, um, marketing campaigns. And um, if Farm Bureau had done something where, let's say in theory, you slightly reduced uh, the uh, cost of being a member in Farm Bureau, and then, or maybe just kept, you know, raised uh, raised membership by only a couple dollars, and then put all of that money into one giant 
endowment for marketing. You could do something where, uh, with respect to dairy, um, you know, an operation that's engaging in agribusiness and an operation that just wants to sell bottled milk, they're both going to be seen in the sense that that money is now going to go towards uh, air rights on radio, television, uh, physical media, things of that nature. And then on top of that, from a uh, advocacy perspective, uh, one that you know Farm Bureau cannot readily achieve. Um, another, um, another. It's not necessarily a program, but more so a rule. Um, the Federal Elections Committee requires uh, radio broadcasters and other um, and other networks to reduce the cost of um, of advertising for political campaigns. If you had something where Farm Bureau went to. Um, went to Tallahassee or DC and said, "Hey, could you find a means of reducing the cost of advertising um, made in America? You know, agriculture. Um, we think it would be very beneficial to promoting uh, consumption of, in our case, Florida agriculture and at uh, at large, you know, uh, agriculture within uh, the United States." Uh, those are just some insights. I think. Yeah, speaking of marketing, I know that um, Florida Farm Bureau is uh, currently one of their campaigns right now is um, now in season, which um, highlights those different commodities um, that are in season. That, you know, more is towards the fruit and vegetable commodities throughout the state. Um, but then they also, they do a, a great job of highlighting those specific industries um, during uh, their national um, Appreciation Month, like for example, June is Dairy Month, and uh, they do a great job of um, not only highlighting the dairy industry as a whole, but really highlighting uh, those Florida families. So I think if there um, was more promotion on the now in season marketing campaign, that could really help um, bring just some community together throughout the Florida agriculture industry, and really showing how um, these different um, commodities and these di different industries really um, build off of each other. I know in the dairy industry, um, whenever um, citrus is going through a hard time, we use a lot of byproducts from, uh, the, from the citrus industry, so we definitely see that effect. So I think it's really important to show um, how each commodity affects the next and really show um, that chain and make sure that that cohesiveness and that sense of community is there throughout the different, you know, 300 plus commodities that we produce throughout the state of Florida too. Um, that's a that's a perfect thing to touch on um, because when you frame it as, um, you know, everyone in different parts of the state is farming a different crop or raising a different form of livestock, and, you know, maybe chopping up their cow or milking. Um, when you put it in the perspective of, you know, some of these things are going to be inputs for another process for someone else down the road, or uh, you know. Whatever you're making is good, uh, you know, going to be going to a grocer or uh, you know some sort of processor. At the end of the day, we're all uh, interconnected. Um, I think that's good culture-wise in terms of getting uh, diverse producers to work with each other, and I think it's also good um, from a marketing perspective. Um, and I'm just going to tie this back here. Uh, if you had something where Florida Farm Bureau had, let's say, uh, put out some sort of media, and I think this is very important because many people don't already think like this. Where um, let's say the media was so you know the marketing campaign was solely concerned with uh, you know how does your food get to you um, you know you could start from the corn farmer who makes corn that eventually gets uh, turned into some sort of feed or mash that it eventually goes to a feedlot or a uh, cow calf operation and eventually goes to a processor eventually goes to a grocery and goes to you if you had things like that that inform the consumer on you know these are the people who are hands on involved in making your food. Um, they're earning a good living off of uh, bringing their food to you, and um, you know it's very integral that you can continue to purchase from them as opposed to overseas um, or from even larger you know uh, firms in the agricultural space. I think that'd be very important. Um, in your opening, uh, kind of just going in a full circle here, you spoke about these cost-saving programs, and I'm just I'm curious to know like what what exactly do you mean by cost-saving programs, and where does Farm Bureau uh, come into play? Whatever you speak. Um, I think Farm Bureau can, um, so Tallahassee's already been on this, but I think Farm Bureau can continue to advocate for uh, tax exemptions, whether it be on different forms of equipment or at animal health products. Uh, I think that's extremely uh, important, it's an easy way of reducing costs. Um, and then also you could find, uh, you, you could have a situation where uh, Farm Bureau encourages, um, at the state, like, I mean the state doesn't need to enforce it, but you, um, setting up cooperative programs where you could have equipment sharing um, or perhaps even equipment sharing could be one of them, uh, perhaps even uh,
community farm insurance, things of that nature. Um, those are just some ideas. So in terms of, in terms of um, policy and uh, working to create that sense of community throughout um, the state of Florida as there are um, multiple different commodities being grown in various, uh, various ways, um, what role do you see policy um, playing in this division and how does Ford Farm Bureau work with um, producers and legislators to make sure that um, both uh, everyone involved is benefiting from from certain policies. Well, I think you have to start with the producers. Uh, Farm Bureau has to meet them at their doorstep, uh, welcome them, and invite them to um, advisory committees. Uh, present them with literature on you know both on, on both topics relating directly to their industry and perhaps even uh, industries adjacent to them. Um, and then from there. Um, let the advisory committees uh, gather, let them speak, let them bring up problems, solutions, um, let the leaders emerge from that, and then from there, um, either meet the legislators at their doorstep in Tallahassee or welcome them to you know, your various different counties. Um, and in that setting, especially in the county setting, one, they could actually take uh, tours of the farm to understand what is it like to, to live here, what is it like to work here. Um, how are the decisions that a le legislator uh, makes, how do they affect the farm? Uh, and then two, they put them in a one-on-one uh, -on -one environment with the people who are actually on the committee. And so you're getting information directly from the horse's mouth. It's not adulterated by a staffer or by a lobbyist. Um, and then once they're, uh, once they're in that setting, I'd argue that uh, everything will see itself through, uh, assuming advisory, uh, advisory committee members are properly articulating the issues that they have uh, and what they would like to be done about it. And quite frankly, many issues, whether it be, um, like a, this was another cost saving policy that just came to mind, like for instance, uh, right to repair. Um, if you had a, um, I'm not familiar with the uh, state Florida stance with respect to right to repair, but if you had something where, uh, let's say you have a John Deere tractor and um, you have a hardware issue, but for whatever reason, John Deere doesn't actually let them work on, uh, you know, um, you know, use secondhand parts, uh, aftermarket parts to fix the issue, and now you have to spend thousands of dollars to get it fixed. If you had right to repair, um, now you can use aftermarket parts, you can do it yourself, you're not paying for sophisticated labor and John Deere's, you know, like first hand parts. Um, so, tying back to what I was originally saying, um, meeting the producers at, this, at the doorstep, welcoming them, welcoming them to committees, letting them know that Farm Bureau is not here necessarily to make decisions for you. For you, we're, we're instead here to put you in a position where you can recommend these decisions to lawmakers, welcoming the lawmakers, showing them what it's like um, to actually you know, work a day in the advisory committee member's shoes, and then hopefully the uh, policy see themselves. Absolutely, yeah, I, I agree. I, um I think you said it perfectly whenever um, you say that Farm Bureau is not here to tell you what to do, but to simply present you uh, with the opportunities. I believe that's kind of, you know, the whole idea of the grassroots organization and really uh, making sure that our, our members and our producers are, are always at the forefront of our thinking and, and uh, whenever it comes to 